All right, so um, John Hand has a, likes these big words, so that's why, um, that's why they're in there. Yeah, so it's his fault. Uh, so this paper is with John Hand. He's at University of North Carolina, and Frank Zhang, who's here. Of the three of us, Frank is the only one with any real experience doing this. So, uh, you know, I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage relative to many of you, um, but hopefully, some of what I'll show is, um, can be useful to you, and or at least interesting. So, I'm gonna characterize some of what's happened in the, over the past couple of decades. You may not agree with all of my characterization of the past, but I, I think it pro will provide an interesting way to discuss what we're doing here. So in this uh, earlier paper, we sort of went back and looked through all of the academic literature on things that uh, researchers had claimed predict stock market returns. And we're talking about equity returns primarily in the US and we're also talking about firm characteristics. We're not doing any um, macro type predictors. And so we looked through, and if you just, this is a count, uh, the cumulative count of the things that, have, that academics have said predict returns. So it, it all began kind of around this time, early in the, in the 1970s, and kind of grew until at the end of 2010 when we stopped collecting them, or, or at least for the paper, we were over 330 different things that academics had said predict stock market returns. So the question kind of comes about what do we do with all of this, right? That's, and I think uh, in academics we've struggled to know what to do with that and the response from academics I think has been a little bit different than the response from investment managers. So uh, first let's, so the, here's, the, here's where the characterization begins. So if um, we have all of these signals. Why have, why have academics been looking for them? Why have practitioners been looking for them? So for the, from the academic side of things, we can think about um, a big fortress wall that has been erected uh, stating that um, markets are efficient and it gave us a paradigm we felt safe within the fortress. And then people started um, publishing these things and it's sort of like they took a pebble and started throwing it at the fortress wall. And the question is, what do you do with all of these pebbles, right? So they're throwing these pebbles, and it's just not, it's not making much difference, right? Throw it, throw it, the, the pebbles are just kind of falling on the ground. Um, practitioners, on the other hand, you know, if you, if you want to go out and see if you're going to make money, it's in your best interest to collect all of those pebbles as they come along and decide what to do with them. So did, did they actually, did academics do this? And then did practitioners do this? So academics, in that same paper we looked, what do um, researchers include in their controls for what predicts returns? So you can see 77% of the papers included firm size in some form or another. A good amount also included book to market and um, some market measure or beta. But then once you get outside of that, especially past momentum, almost no papers include something else. So then if you think about as a um, investment manager or, an, or a personal or an investor in general, what have you done with it or what, what do you do? Um, my guess is many of you go beyond those few, right? or at least some of you do. And the reason you might go beyond is because you want to know, I found a new signal should I add it to my model or not? Right. So the question then that we're going to try and do is say, what, what might, we might believe should have happened is as a, let's say we're all Bayesian updaters and we get a new signal, we try and update and see what our model should be. But that doesn't appear to have happened, at least for, for the most part in academics. Um, we kind of stopped with the paradigm with the big fortress wall and kind of ignored the pebbles that are falling on the ground. So we're going to ask, let's catch us up. Let's get back up to where what we should have done all along is put them all together and see what happens. So we're not the first to do this. Let's take a step back. So 25 years ago, or, a, or around, yeah, well, 26 years ago, some people called Jacobs, uh, Jacobs and Levy, they did something, right? Um, and you see here it says, so you could pretend that this, this, these lines are actually our paper, but it's, it's from theirs. It says, 
Most previous stock market anomaly research has focused on one or two return regularities at a time. Interestingly, that hasn't changed much since then. Right? Most papers, even in 2010, were doing the same thing that they were discussing here. And they said, well, we're going to go and look and see, are these independent signals? And what happens when you measure them together? Well, because people sort of ignored that, um, we're going to do the same exercise, but moving out here. Right? So then a little bit after them, um, Fama and French do something similar. They say, oh, by the way, they use 25. So which means, if you look here on this cumulative graph, when they performed it, that's basically everything that was available at the time, plus a few that we categorized a little bit later because we used the publication date. So basically, they used pretty much everything that was available at the time. So then a few years later, Fama French say, we're going to take five. So they took a little small set of these anomalies and said, let's figure out which one of these are incremental. And so of those five, so it's not exactly fair because people knew beta didn't work at the time, or in terms of it didn't predict returns, so they included that. So really, they're looking at four different things that supposedly predict returns, and they find two of them. So let's go back to the big fortress wall anomaly. So people are throwing things at, throw, throwing pebbles at the fortress wall. Fama and French, here's what they do. They say, okay, we've got these pebbles. What do we do with them? Let's um, put, put them back on the wall, right? So they, they take the pebbles and try and build up the wall. And so essentially what has happened then, they say, instead of the, the, the concepts behind what we have done in the past are right, we just need to redefine the wall a little bit. So this is where I think things started to diverge between investment managers and practitioners and academics. So I, I, not to put words in your mouths, but sort of if you read this paper, it comes out as there might be some inefficiencies in the market. You, you read this, this paper and it sounds like we just measured things wrong. Uh, this is risk. Right? And so then, because we now have a new paradigm of a new fortress wall, we're OK with that. We're just going to hold on to that wall. So then what do you make of, you know, as, right after all of this, the number of anomalies that started popping up were enormous. And so an interpretation could be, well, a few little pebbles didn't work. So let's put them all together, and let's huck a big cannonball at the fortress wall and see what happens. Okay? And that's sort of what we are trying to do in this paper, is build up the cannonball as big as possible and try again. And of course, in the end, we're not going to conclude one way or the other. I, you know, we may lean towards the Jacobs-Levy side of things, but we, it could be risk also. right? We don't, we don't know. All we want to know is, are they incremental predictors of returns or not? So after, so one, let's stay in this camp again, the Fama French, everything is risk camp. So what happened when things started popping up, that all of these things predict returns? There were some explanations for that. And some of the explanations were, well, the market's still efficient, and this is just risk. Another explanation was, the market's still efficient, and it's just that transactions cost and arbitrage costs are so high that um, it's really risk. These are not real. And then there was another side of things that's a statistical argument that uh, we're just uncovering in-sample patterns in the data that won't replicate out of sample. It's because we're just data mining and we're not capturing economic um, drivers of returns. So because of that, oh, by the way, so then uh, John Cochran later said, we better repeat the Fama French exercise. So he said that, I didn't, so I should have, you know, maybe we sh he should have said, we need to repeat the exercise of Jacobs, Levy, and Fama French, and, you know, prior people. Uh, but he says, we need to go back and see what of, which of these actually predict returns. So because of the, the, so we're back to the fortress wall. If we want to huck a cannonball at the fortress wall, we sort of need to be careful about how we construct things, because if we throw it again in the same way everyone else has done it, um, then we might claim things like 
It still is in, in sample overfitting, so it's not going to work out of sample. It still is um, arbitrage risk or transactions cost. So there are, there are concerns. So our whole approach in setting up this paper was to be very careful about how we construct things, how we put the test together, so that in the best way we possibly can, we can say we've avoided a lot of the concerns that people have talked about. So if we still find that a bunch of things predict returns, then um, hopefully that will change the prior beliefs that the wall is as solid as we think. Uh, so what do we do to, to address some of these concerns? Well, first, we only use signals that are studied in prior research. There are, undoubtedly, there are other things, so that 330 that we found, there's, there are other things we're sure. Um, but we stick with what's been in the academic literature. Then we also use the latest data, so some of that will then be out of sample, so there's one additional thing that will help. We also use consistent definitions, so once we set up our test, we don't, we don't kind of cater or kind of adjust the definitions of the variables for every individual variable. Because if we did that, although in practice you might want to do that to get the best predictors, um, if we did that, then we run the risk again that we're overfitting all of our variables to the data again. And then um, we also use, so Harvey, Liu, and Xu say the statistical cutoff is wrong. If we're doing 1.96 as the T statistic, um, if, if we're multi in a multiple testing framework where we keep going back to the same data, we should use a higher cutoff for deciding whether something is statistically significant. So everything I'm going to talk about, we focus on their, their suggested t-statistic is 3.0 instead of kind of lower bound. And then we also do a bunch of different methodologies to help at least make sure we're not just picking it up because of what we do. Then, oh, one other thing that I didn't put on here, then we split it by size to make sure it's also not just that's our proxy for deciding whether it's just driven by trading or arbitrage cost. So really quick on how we set it up. So you can imagine if we have 330 different signals and, or more, as, as more have come out since we did that in the, just over the past couple of years, um, that's a monumental task to, to understand each paper and code up each paper. So we started with 100, and the bounds that we put on that were, let's use common databases. So there are a bunch of these signals that don't use kind of common databases. So we start there so anyone can go back and recalculate these. And um, we also use signals that just the independent signals. So a bunch of signals, people have seen that you can interact the variables. We, we ignore that for now. And then we also have the problem that many of these variables have big outliers, and so how do we deal with that? So our approach to deal with that was to rank all of the variables. We show a couple of robustness to not ranking. Um, and then we align them all in calendar month. So some of the variables are annual variables, some of the variables are quarterly variables, some are monthly variables. But we found that um, over half of the studies use monthly returns, so we decided we would start there. So the key part here is we don't, once we set that, we just, we don't redefine our methodology, okay? The, and all in the hope that we're not creating more problems. And then one of the first comments we got from everyone, and we kind of thought that would be the case, is a bunch of them are gonna be really highly correlated. Well, so we found um, nine of them that actually were really highly correlated. And then I'll show you in a minute, the rest weren't so correlated. So, so let's stop then. So, let's say, so we're regressing, after we take out the, the nine, that's 91 signals that we, ca that we came up, that we, uh, we didn't come up with them, we calculated them. And um, what would you expect? So we asked a bunch of, not on, on purpose, just kind of in discussions with people, how many do you think, if we put them all in there, would actually survive? And the academic side of things was very different from um, practitioner responses. So the academic side of things was, yeah, five, maybe ten are going to survive. They're all going to be measuring the same thing. So, you know, you can think about what your response. By the way, the Jacobs-Levy paper found ten. 
So now we, we should sort of know that it's going to be something like that. Um, most of the re responses from investment managers that we've had is, yeah, we already know there are a lot. So, you know, the background is already different. Um, but of course, then the response was, well, all right, which, which ones? Right? Did you find one that I don't have? So, um, so, you know, so depending on your priors on what we should find, um, you know, you'll either find this surprising or it'll kind of be as you expected. So we take out the nine, we find that um, the ab mean absolute correlation is around 8%, which at least from our beliefs and many that we've talked to, that's a lot lower than we thought. And we find that 24 of the 91 are significant at the, with a T stat of at least 3.0. So we think, that's why we call it remarkable, because that was much higher than academics had said before. You can think about your own models. Do you have a model that you think, you know, is it 24 large? Uh, you know, maybe, some of you, some of you not. And we think that this is, might be understated, because um, all of our efforts are likely to make our estimates conservative. So. Um, we know, for instance, if we recalculate a few of these variables, you can get that number to be higher, but then, you know, then you have the concern, is, does it going to work out of sample? And also, so there is some um, evidence that some of the concerns are valid. So once we do all of these, we create all of these variables in this kind of uniform way, we only find about half of them are significant by themselves. So what that means to us is we're using out of sample data, so that may bias down the, the estimates, or not bias down, that may get us to a not in sample overfitted estimate, which will be lower. And then also, um, if you change the methodology in a few cases, it, some of these aren't as robust as prior papers might have claimed. So there's a little bit of this flavor that what other people have said that it is not all robust, it may be true. Uh, but then, you know, the, the fact that we find so many that still are is, is sort of surprising. Then we also find a few other kind of interesting things. We don't know what to do with all of it, but, you know, we think it's interesting. So the number of signals that are significant is larger for small companies. But the R squared with the smaller number of signals that are significant is larger for large companies. And then the returns to the multidimensional strat, uh, so the coefficients are cut in about half when we use, when you measure them all together versus individually, which means some of the signals are picking up things that other signals are also picking up. And so that was what, in your paper earlier, you called this a, the pure measurement, and this is the naive measurement. And then we do a bunch of things to see if it's robust, and we also do a pseudo out of sample, so you know, some of it's not out of sample it's technically, and we get a sharp ratio of around 2.6. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit. We want to compare that to not using all of the signals. So we, you know, the comparison is how much of an improvement in the sharp ratio can we get. And then at the very end, so a bunch of people want to know, well, what model should we use? If we're going to try and predict, or if we're going to try and measure risk, what model should we use? Really, we don't know. But we, we, we're, I'm going to show you a 10 characteristic model that does a pretty good job of representing the cross-section of returns. So on one hand, um, we're going to side with the earlier papers by Jacob, Jacobs Levy. And then on the other hand, we're going to say, all right, if you want to take the risk measurement approach, we'll give you something that maybe is sort of like that. So here's an example of some of the ones. Um, you know, you'll recognize a lot of the things that are a lot of the variables we use. Most of them are not terribly surprising. So we include a lot of the ones that have been included in prior papers. So all of the Fama French ones, the we include the ones that Jacobs Levy had, uh, not in all of the same measurement approaches, but we include them. Uh, momentum, analyst forecast, volatility, so it, basically anything we could find that we could fairly straight, in a fairly straightforward manner measure, we put in there. So here's a, after we took out the nine that are correlated at about 90%, this is the distribution of the correlations between the, the signals. 
So we call them RPS, so return predictive signals. So the correlation between all of those RPS on average is very low. So you st we still have a few that are sort of correlated, you know, sort of highly out here. But for most of them, the correlations are quite low. So one of the first concerns we seem to always get is, well, you're, you have big multicollinearity problems. It doesn't appear to be the case. So. And here's the summary of kind of our main results. So if we use the t-statistic cutoff of 3.0, we find that for all firms, something by, if you measure them all by themselves, without including other variables in the regressions, 35 of them are significant. If we, once we include them all together, 24 are significant. That's the number we say um, is kind of the multidimensional nature of, of the market. So we would say that there are something like 24 variables out there that seem to matter. Notice, though, that it, firm size matters. So large, for large firms, we find six are statistically significant, and that increases as you get to small firms where 21 are significant. And then also you notice that's smaller than what we have altogether, which means for some of the variables, the difference between uh, the, they're capturing some difference between large and small firms. So when you separate them out, um, they lose their power. Then some of the details. Um, some variables, so, you, you know, if you're clearing up noise in some, of the S, in some of the variables and you're trying to measure them individually, some become significant. So earnings to price, for example, all by itself isn't really significant. And then when you include it with everything else, it becomes a strong, significant predictor. And the magnitude is fairly similar. So it's just picking up, it's including everything is kind of picking up the noise. Oh, so this one, if you use the three, 0.0 cutoff, the forecast, analyst forecast of earnings, um, it's significant in the, in when you measure it by itself, it's insignificant with the 3.0 cutoff if you measure it all together, and the magnitude is significantly smaller. So we have a pretty large magnitude when measured by itself, a very small magnitude when it's measured um, all together. And then we also have those that remain significant, but just the magnitude is cut. So that book to market, um, the significance is there by itself or all together, but the magnitude is, is about half moving from by itself to, to measuring everything together. Okay. So then the, the natural question comes up, well, which one should we care about? Well, I'm going to show you a couple approaches we've used to doing that. So if we use, the, just looking at the ones that have the biggest T statistics, some of the ones that show up are not the ones that are often used. So because I'm in the accounting field, well, not because I'm in, it, that isn't why it showed up so high, but um, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't have started that way. Um, it, I'm happy about it because I'm in the accounting field. That um, post-earnings announcement drift, so un changes in earnings happens to be high on the list. Another one that is not so highly cited is the return around the earnings announcement. So the second one is earnings announcement return. It's the three-day return around earnings announcements, and which is sort of surprising because um, that three-day window return forecast months of returns ahead, right? So that's sort of interesting. And scaled forecast of earnings. So this is just analyst forecast of earnings. So the top three are Accounting, right? So, so I guess to, to, to come back from the disparaging comments that we saw over lunch that accounting messes everything up. Um, you know, we get some things right, I guess, at least in this. And then you'll notice some others, um, volume and turnover type measures matter. And of course, we're doing monthly returns, so you would expect those um, to be sort of important. Then you look down and see these ones down here. So because we have a vested interest in kind of the academic literature, we show these. So book to market, size, and momentum don't rank anywhere near the top of the most significant variables. So a conclusion from this would be, yeah, there may be a set of variables that we should use when we're explaining returns, 
but we must have been focusing on the wrong ones. Um, at least, we're not focusing on the ones that are most important. Which, I think we see that in practice and in academics, right? So, um, kind of the smart beta, smart alpha discussion. Um, lots of funds, I don't know if you're included in this, have a focus on growth and another on size and, or small growth or large growth. Right? So, um, at least from the preliminary stuff we're showing here, maybe such an, uh, strong emphasis on these few characteristics may not be warranted. So. Then a few more things. So if you break it down by size, um, it also there's some interesting differences. So for book to market, it actually comes in for the largest companies. Momentum, uh, I mean size, actually comes in for the smallest companies. This, this is not a new result. But the things that show up for large and small companies are different. At least some of them are different. Um, and if you want to stare at it long enough, you might be able to see some kind of patterns. So in the small cap, you see surprise earnings and kind of growth type variables seem to matter. Changes in kind of balance sheet items seem to matter. They don't seem to matter for large firms. The trading one, trading type, you know, volume and type, those type of measures seem to really matter for small firms. So there is some sort of pattern here um, that we hope we understand at some point, but you know, that's I guess for thinking about later. So as I showed before, the returns that you, that you measure using a signal by itself are much larger than the returns that you get if you measure everything together. So one sort of, I, I, I understand that in some of the comments that I've had with some practitioners, what they have told me is, if I tell you here's a return on the signal, I just cut it in half in terms of what I think can, I can actually earn, right? So just by measuring everything together, that sort of confirms that. Um, these are regressions of the returns measured when, they're, when a signal's measured by itself versus the returns when it's measured by, um, when they're all measured together. So it's about half. Then I guess the question comes up, so if you move out of sample, does this work? Well, we, for a lot of these signals that we documented, they're, um, they're in sample, right? So we can't really do a strict out of sample. Some of them are actually strict out of sample. They were, they were measured a long time ago and we can see that. So we do this same thing that many of you do. We go back and do a historical back test, and we estimate over 10 years the expected um, coefficients on each um, of the 91 variables, and then come up with a predicted return. This is a, the hedge return of taking the highest ones that are, have the highest predicted returns versus the ones that have the lowest predicted returns, and what we get using each of these type of models. So we use the size, book to market, and momentum in one model. We use, Fama French has a new one that they said, well, we need to actually add profitability and growth, so they add that. And then the one where we use all of the 91 that we have. And you can see that the sharp ratio and the t-statistics go up the more of this information you include. So the sharp ratio with just size, book to market, and momentum is slightly under one. Adding profitability and growth gets you up slightly over one. And by using all of the signals, you are more than doubling the sharp ratio. So here's, here's it in picture form. So these are the cumulative returns for large and mid-cap companies. And so we, you know, we wanted to at least sort of get closer to practice and what might be possible. And you see if you use Carhartt, or that's the four factor, or the enhanced kind of four factor with the Fama French 2013, this is the cumulative return. The using all of these variables clearly dominates um, using a small set of factors. Then we might say, um, 
If we then want to turn and use these as, if you're on, so there are two things. If you are a, pra, an, a researcher that wants to say, I found a new signal and it's incrementally significant, what do I measure it against? Uh, we might then want a model that's sort of manageable, right? So if I conclude and say, as a researcher, now you have to include 100 or 300 things and see if your signal is incremental to that. Um, no one's going to program that up. And then if as, a investment, as an investment manager, then you would say, well, if we want to con control for risk or we want to control for expected returns and see how our alpha compares to that, we might want some sort of model that's manageable. So all we did was, so this is in sample. Um, the, this may not be the best model. This is just an attempt at sort of approximating a good model. We just took the 10 characteristics that generate the highest R squared. And so can we get a, a 10 factor or 10 characteristic model that sort of does a good job? So these are the ones that show up. So book to market is in there. So hooray for everyone that likes that. And then back to, so you know, us accounting people, we've got unexpected earnings in there and quarterly um, earnings. And then there are a few momentum ones and asset growth. And then there are a couple of um, kind of monthly trading volume type measures. And if you see the, the one using all 91 gets us a sharp ratio of 2.5. The 10 factor one or the 10 characteristics one gets us a higher sharp ratio. So I guess here's the question. So what do you make of that? Well, I think part of that means there is a little bit of overfitting happening in sample. So by, by reducing the set a little bit, we're reducing some of the out of sample. I mean, we're reducing some of the noise that is getting fitted in sample and allows us to do slightly better out of sample. Okay? So what does it look like? So we're. I was surprised by this, at least. Um, so this 10-factor model, um, part of it, the benefit in the Sharpe ratio comes because it smooths out some of what's happening here. Right? But then also, in terms of capturing all of the information that's in the 91, it does a pretty reasonable job. If we, want, if we are trying to summarize what's available in all of the signals out there, that's um, you know, not bad. So, I guess in conclusion, the, you know, what, I would, what we hope happens here is that maybe the wall, the fortress wall, isn't collapsing, but at least we need to think about what that wall is made of and what we're putting into it. And also what all of these things, if they actually are return predictors, what that means and, and kind of what, where we go from here, right? Is this, do we need to have all of these things that are risk characteristics? Or are we be able to find some alpha because we have a bunch of things uh, in our model? But it, at a minimum, um, it does suggest that we are losing a lot of power um, by not kind of searching and getting all of the available information out there. So I look forward to the comments. Thank you very much.